Are you concerned about the volatility in the uh, financial markets today? Do you think something needs to be done okay. to reduce it? I, I, I love volatility. I, I think I remember when uh, in 1972 the market went from uh, uh, down dramatically and Taco Bell went from 14 to 1. They had no debt. They never had a, a restaurant close. And uh, I started buying at 7, but I, I kept on to it and it went to 1. And uh, it was the largest position in Magellan in 1978 when it was bought out for, by $42 by Pepsi Cola. And I think it would have gone to 400 if they didn't buy it out. I think volatility is terrific. I think it is very, I think these callers are very important. I don't think the market going up 80 points one day and down 80 the next uh, is a good thing for the public. I think that's not a very good thing. But I think all of these callers and all these other things, to keep the volatility down each day is important. But the market's going to go up and down. Well, the, human nature hasn't changed a lot in 25,000 years. And some event will come out of left field and uh, the market will go down or the market will go up. So I, volatility will occur, and markets will continue to have these ups and downs. I think that's a great opportunity if people can understand what they own. If they don't understand what they own, they can own mutual funds, try and figure out what mutual funds they own, and keep adding to it. Over, basically, corporate profits have grown about 8% a year, historically. So corporate profits double about every nine years. The stock market ought to double about every nine years. So I think the next market's about 3,800 today, 3,700. I'm pretty convinced the next 3,800 points will be up. It won't be down. The next 500 points, the next 600 points, I don't know which way they're going. So the market ought to double in the next eight or nine years. It ought to double again in the eight or nine years after that. Because profits will go up 8% a year and, and stocks will fall. That's all there is to it. We're in the month of October. Beware of the month of October, the witching month for the stock market. What do you see uh, as the uh, outlook for this month? And when do you think the Dow will hit 4,000. Okay. The uh, October has always been a special month. Uh, I remember in 1987, I was very, uh, you know, I was very convinced that Mark was, in no, was not, not in trouble and I didn't worry about things. And Carol and I had planned this great uh, golf vacation to Ireland and we we're going to visit one course and set a little house and visit another, go all along the west coast of Ireland and play golf. And we left on a Thursday night and uh, the market went down 55 points that day, which was not too good. And uh, <laughs> the next day we got to Ireland because of the time difference, we'd completed our day. And I got back to the hotel and I called in. The market had gone down 112 on Friday. And I said to Carolyn, uh, you know, I think if the, if the market goes down on Monday, uh, you, you know, we're going to have to go back. And, uh, and so we might as well, we stayed there for the weekend. And, uh, and on Monday the market went down 508 points and my fund went from, uh, I think 12 billion to 8 billion, and uh, that gets your attention, you know, in a <laughs> two, two working days, you know, I said, at the end of this week, I'd be, uh, have no fun. Now, there wasn't a lot I could do. I mean, here I was on Monday because the market uh, didn't open, you know, by 12 o'clock, it was in Ireland, it was still uh, 7 o'clock in New York. So we did spend that day, and we, uh, we, did, we played around golf in the morning, and then we went somewhere and sort of watched the market uh, deteriorate. And, uh, and, uh, I did come back. There wasn't nothing I could do. I mean, just uh, th th nothing I could do about it. it uh, but I think my shareholders, they called up and they said, well, what's Lynch doing? They said, well, he's on the sixth hole and he's, uh, you know, he's even par up to now, but he's in a trap. This could be, you know, this could be a triple bogey here. This could be a, could be a big inning. And uh, I, don't th I don't think that's exactly what they want to hear. That I, you know, they, so I could do something about this damn thing. So I came back home and uh, suffered with everybody else. And, and uh, fortunately, uh, I was very consistent. Uh, my, uh, the market went down, when I ran Magellan on uh, 13 years, the market went down nine times, and every time the market went down, Magellan went down. It was nine for nine. And, uh, you know, because it's, it's, very, it's very important. There's another one of these numbers you ought to write down. If you put $1,000 in a stock, all you can lose is 1000 I've done that several times. And, uh, but if you're right, you can make 5000 10000 20000 So this business, you don't have to be right one out of two times. You can be right one out of four. It's a long time. The times you're right, you know the company's doing well, you know they're doing a great job, and you add to it, or at least you don't sell it, which is a terrible tragedy. So you can make more money on the upside. So I just, I just wrote those out, and I will now flip a coin to tell you where the market will go to 4,000, this year or next year. Uh, heads means it goes up, it's a two-headed coin. Uh, <laughs> the market will go up in the next year. That's, it. That's all I ever know about the stock market.
Well, we have, uh, as you can imagine, many questions about uh, where people should put their money. I'm going to divide it into two parts, and if uh, you can address it. Uh, this questioner intends to put $1,000 yearly into my four-year-old daughter's education fund. Where should I put it? Invest it one. The other just covers everybody else. What are, your, what are some of your current mar market favorites and why? Well, on, on the first one, and this is, this is important whether you're investing for a four-year-old, a 14-year-old, or a 74-year-old, you have to say, what am I going to do when the market goes down? Because I've had audiences like this, larger audiences, and I'll say, how many people in the room are short-term investors? I've never had anybody ever raise their hand. I mean, everybody in the world is a long-term investor until the market goes down. And like in 90, I remember 1990. 1990 was so much scarier than 87. 87, the market just <coughs> fell down. And you call up companies and said, our business is terrific. We're about to announce a stock, stock buyback. We're already buying back our stock. Business is great, and we can't figure this out. But in 1990, you had Kuwait invaded. You had uh, the banking system really on the ropes. I mean, really close. You call up a company and they said their business was slowing down. We sent 500,000 troops to Saudi, and uh, we were about to fight what people thought was the, uh, remember this, was the, it was the fourth largest army in the world, and they were the toughest army in the world, and we were, this was going to be a terrible war, and that we ought to sit them out. Remember the theory, the big theory, there's a lot of people in this city saying, we ought to wait them out. You know, we'd still be waiting there at 120 degrees <laughs> with our 500,000 people. I mean, I think Bush made an incredibly uh, brave decision with, on the information he was getting to go in there and uh, knock them out, or would still be there. But that was an ugly time, and uh, that was very scary. And the public stood, lot, some people learned from 87, and they stood throughout that and said, I'm confident about the next 5, 10, 15 years of this country, and they hung in there. So I would say if you want to buy a small growth fund, or you want to buy a balanced fund that's part bonds and part stocks, you put so much money in, put more in every year, you'll be very pleased in 10, 20, 30 years. Stocks will beat the hell out of money markets. They can beat the hell out of bonds. No group of, you think of it, any corporations, McDonald's, any of these great companies, Marriott, you name it, they've never got together and said, geez, you know, we're really doing well. Why don't we raise the coupon in our bonds? You know, those, those bondholders have been really loyal. You know, you know, we, you know we've been given 8%. Why don't we raise it to 9 You know, uh, But companies like Automatic Data Processing, they do payrolls, an amazing prosaic company, 32 years of higher earnings. 32 years of double-digit earnings growth. We've had recessions, we've had wars, we've had changes in Congress, changes in the Supreme Court. 32 years about earnings. So, I mean, that's what you're relying on. Johnson Johnson, 30 years about earnings. I mean, these are general parts, 42 years about earnings. Emerson Electric, 38 years about earnings. You don't see companies like this in other parts of the world. So I think uh, that's what you buy when you buy a fund. You're buying a bunch of good companies. And the second question was when again? Uh, just your... Uh, oh, my, oh, the stocks. Best stocks. Best I, best well, <coughs> well, I think... I think the financial area has been uh, hurt heavily in the uh, stock market. I think that's an attractive area. Uh, stocks like Chemical or Travelers or Citicorp or Bank of Boston or Fleet or Shamit, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, these stocks have all come down. Their business is terrific. They've improved their balance sheets. They're selling at multiples half or, or one third lower than the general market. I think the cyclicals, I think we have a chance for the cyclicals for the first time in a long time. The, uh, the steels, the papers, the aluminums, the chemicals. I mean, it's their turn to come to the plate. And uh, I think there's going to be a good time the next, uh, we seem to have an economy recovering in uh, Latin America. Brazil is turning around. These are facts again. When you hear these facts, these countries are really, India, I've been visited India. Things are really improving in India. Europe had the worst recession since the depression. There's 18 million people out of work, 18 million people out of work in Western Europe right now. And the economy is starting to slowly turn. Japan is bottom. So I think you're going to see a demand. And commodity prices have been, aluminum prices got to 30-year low. Now they've, ingot has almost doubled. Uh, you're going to see the same thing with liner board. So you're going to see a very good uh, time for cyclical stocks. And I think the auto stocks are also extremely cheap at four or five times earnings. I think, I think the economy is going to be, my opinion, from the companies I talk to and the, and the business I look at, things are not off uh, trend line. These are not extraordinary times. 
Housing is very affordable. It's not as affordable as it was two years ago, but on a 20-year basis, housing is very affordable. Automobiles are very affordable. Uh, consumer durables are very affordable. I think people are going to, uh, and, and we, we've added, as you know, I, I still don't understand when people, we hear the job growth, we've added, uh, in the recession we lost 1.8 million jobs, and now we've added back uh, 5.8 million, 4.5 million in the last uh, 19 months. So we lost 1.8 and we've added 5.8 back, we're 4 million to the good. The tough part of it is we dropped about 600,000 manufacturing jobs and we've only brought back 100,000 manufacturing jobs. But there are a lot more people working, and I, I think that trend is going to continue. And in the decade of the 80s, I think this is key. The decade of the 80s, the only, this is what you hear from the press. This is what you hear from TV. In the decade of the 80s, the 500 largest companies eliminated 3 million jobs. 3 million jobs. But there was 2.1 million businesses started in the 1980s. And if they just have 10 people each, that's 21 million jobs. This is an incredible job machine we have in America. So that's what happened in the 80s. These 2.1 million businesses created all the jobs. And the decade of the 90s, the top 500 companies are going to eliminate another 3 million people. And all you ever hear about is company X lays off 5,000 people in Hartford, and company Y lays off 5,000 people in Rochester, and somebody doesn't buy a sofa in Scottsdale, Arizona, because they're reading their newspaper about another layoff in the Northeast. I mean, that's the nature. These companies have to do it to stay, stay competitive. That's our business. And we've had in the last two and a half years, been a phenomenal, uh, this has been a great thing for our country. We've had 1,750 companies come public. They've raised over $100 billion. There's only 2,500 companies in your side chain. 1,750 companies is a lot. They're going to put this into research and development. They're going to put it into, into more plant, more efficient equipment. This is a fantastic thing for these companies. So I, I think the situation is excellent. The banking system, for the first time since the early 50s, a lot of people follow the banking industry. The banking system today has more investments on the left side of the balance sheet. You talk about the, the governments they own, the mortgage-backed securities they own, then they have loans. First time ever since 1951. And they're only making 50, 20, 30 basis points. They said love to make loans. The banking system has the highest equity to assets in 45 years. The banking system is ready to go. There's lots of liquidity around. I don't know why so people are so depressed about people getting hired all the time. I can't quite figure this out. I, that, I don't know. I have never met a banker, and anybody in, in business, that likes recessions. I've yet to find these people, you know. So I think, I think it's very good the economy's doing well. Well, speaking of banks, are you concerned about uh, banks being uh, uh, allowed to offer mutual funds and the confusion that creates among... Uh, investors over whether uh, bank deposits are insured or not insured or how much is insured or the okay. whole question of deregulation. Okay. No, I think it's, I think it's very positive banks who are be allowed to sell mutual funds because they'll probably sell a lot of Fidelity mutual funds. So that's uh, <laughs> that's uh, very important. No, but uh, seriously, I think it's very important that people understand when they own a bond fund that bonds can go up and down. Bonds are just about as volatile as stocks. And if they own a 30-year bond fund, that you can lose 25, 30% of your money very fast, even though they're government bonds. Uh, people have to understand this. There's an incredible rate of illiteracy in, in, in our public, and all they ever hear about is what happened today to Bristol-Myers going up 2 or $3, or what happened to Dow Jones. They don't get to learn anything about America. And people at some point in their career are presented, they're near retirement, they're given $450,000, $500,000 because it's an early retirement. They have no experience. They don't know what a bond is, they don't know what stocks are, and they have to make a decision in 30 or 60 days or they have a big tax consequence. These people have had no experience learning about the stock market. It's a tragedy. So I think anything we can do to educate the public, if you can convince people, if they understand the volatility of the stock market, I'm not saying anybody should buy a stock. I'm just saying if you, buy a, if you purchase a stock, you ought to do certain things. If you purchase a stock and do certain things, you will do better. If you're not ready to do those things, you, you should keep your money in the bank. Keep your money in a money market fund. Some people aren't willing to do the homework. They don't have the stomach for it. They should stay out. They're not doing Betty any good by taking half their life savings and putting in the stock market. Or they've, they've been lucky enough to save $50,000 or $60,000 to send their kids to college, and one's going to start in a year, and they're going to take all that money and put it on an equity mutual fund with a one-year horizon. That's doing no one any good. So I think the more, whether it's the banks that explain it, the brokers that explain it, 
Anybody that does, and we're working on this at the SEC, the SEC is working very hard on this to explain to people the nature of these products. If they understand them, they'll do better with it. More information, the mayor of Fidelity is launching a major study. Uh, it'll be out the end of this year on retirement. We've interviewed over 1,600 people, over 300 experts. We're going to put a major study on trying to explain to people about nature of retirement and how they can best understand how they should invest their assets. We're not going to mention Fidelity at all, of course. It may be subliminal in it, but, uh, but we're trying to help. And it, uh, the more we can do this, and there's been an incredible push by the SEC to do this, and I think it's a very positive element. A couple of questions about that. Uh, <coughs> what do you think of the SEC's proposal to require mutual funds to adopt a quantitative rating scale for uh, riskiness, number one? And what effect uh, do you feel that the new uh, uh, shareholder rights proposals for more open disclosure and communication are having on companies and the markets. Okay. Uh, on the second one, I'm not too familiar with the first one. On the second one, I think you have to be careful with, in crossing the bridge on, on how much we get involved in managing companies. Uh, I think you, there should be disclosure of what people are getting paid. There should be disclosure of how many shares they own. But I don't think we should be deciding whether they should make this acquisition or whether they should expand this plant when you get too involved in running a company, it's very complex. And a lot of great companies have made a lot of decisions you haven't heard about because they decided not to do something. Some of the best decisions they didn't do was to not do something. And if they're under all this pressure from shareholders uh, of what to do and what not to do, they're going to take their eye off the ball and they're not going to be able to run the business. And companies are doing well because they look, the companies do well, look out five, six, seven years. And some of the decisions they make may not be the right thing for the next year. The more and more we concentrate on what they're doing and we keep commenting on as outsiders, it's going to be run by an enormous committee and we'll get committee results. So I don't think that's going to help anybody. But disclosure of relevant facts of how many options people have or the options at the market, what they're, what they're being paid, I think that's important, how many shares they own, what the company's doing. I think this, they used to not have a letter. I mean, it's, it's not that recently that you have comments by the chief executive at the, at the stop and end report. They never used to have to make that. There's a letter saying what happened. I mean, it really is a very valuable piece of information. You don't realize this company spent a lot of time on this. It's a very serious document. I think it's very helpful to shareholders. The, sh the quarterly shareholder reports are excellent. And also, I've stressed, you, everybody in America can get a hold of a company. It's not Fidelity and Putnam and Dreyfus. You can get a hold of a company if you own 100 shares. You're gonna, you can call a company, somebody will talk to you about it. That people don't take advantage of that. These companies are willing to talk. On this quantitative and qualitative risk ratings, I think if it could be done, I think it might be positive. I'm a little confused on it. I'm not that up to date on it. But I think people should understand you know, that certain stock funds, emerging growth funds that invest in companies that have 50 million or sales, and very small and much more volatile than when you're buying major quality blue, blue chip growth companies. And that long term bonds are more valuable than medium term bonds, which are more volatile than one year bonds. I think these are things that should be explained to people. People should get a menu like you get at Howard Johnson.